Welcome to Zooming In at the Unpopulist. I'm Landry Ayers. On our last episode, we heard from Unpopulist columnist and director of election policy at the Rainey Center, Andy Craig, on why he believes removing Donald Trump from the 2024 presidential ballot is, in fact, not anti-democratic. Today, we wanted to give you the opportunity to hear a counter-argument. Today's debate, which features both Andy and, for the opposition, The Washington Post's Jason Willick, is not filled with the bad faith interruptions, name calling, or any of the other shallow chaos associated with modern debates. Andy and Jason discuss whether or not January 6th was an insurrection, the merits of the argument that the president is not an officer, and what we can expect from the Supreme Court's soon to be released decision. We hope you enjoy it. We go now to the Unpopulist's senior editor and the moderator for this debate, Bernie Belvedere. Welcome to Zooming In with the Unpopulist. I'm your host for today's episode, Bernie Belvedere. The topic of today's debate is whether Trump should be disqualified from the ballot based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I'm joined by Unpopulist columnist and director of election policy at the Rainey Center, Andy Craig. Andy, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. And also by Jason Willick, columnist for The Washington Post, formerly of The Wall Street Journal. Jason, thanks for coming on. Good to be with you. So right off the bat, I want to tackle the insurrection question. And I want to do so by bringing up something that I heard from last Thursday's SCOTUS hearing on the arguments that Trump's camp and the other side have brought up. So Trump's lawyer argued that two critical criteria were missing from January 6th that disallows us to see it as an insurrection. Number one, it was chaotic, not organized. And number two, it was not an attempt to overthrow the government. So he therefore called it a riot rather than an insurrection. Jason, let me start with you. What do you think of that particular argument? Oh, I think it's uh, basically correct. But I think you know, the reason that this case is not going to turn on that question, and it's instead going to turn on a process question, um, is because it's so hard to figure out what's an insurrection. So it's important that we have a reliable process in place to do that. And I think that's that's the main problem with the disqualification is there's been no, no criminal um, process to make that determination. You know, that said, you know, if you want to get to the merits, to me, you know, the term insurrection as used in Section 3 was used after the Civil War, which was obviously political violence on a much larger scale. You know, it was people, the, the Confederates claiming sovereignty over territory as separate from the national government. The, another example that people use in American history is the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s in Western Pennsylvania, which once again basically included uh, the whiskey rebels basically claiming sovereignty, basically claiming that they were um, subjects of a different government uh, from the government of the United States. And I think that's fundamentally different from an election dispute. It's certainly different from an election riot over who won the election, especially when the magnitude of, of violence is, is you know, ugly and, and awful and, and lots, of, lots of people were injured and one woman in the in the mob was shot and killed in the whiskey rebellion you know hundreds of men were under arms you know carrying guns uh you know being prepared to to fight a, a battle in a traditional sense not not a riot so i i basically agree with it but i think what's more important is just that no process has been followed to uh or no adequate process has been followed to make that determination and, and we'll get to the process in just a second i want to stay on this point for a moment. And I, I want to press you on this just a little because uh, it, it seems as if the constitutional amendment gives us a kind of rough sketch of what an insurrection um, should be understood to be in the future. And when I asked you whether th this particular case fits, you compared it to past cases rather than seeing if it fits according to the much more, you know, admittedly permissive language of the constitution itself. What do you think about the argument that although we could say that January 6th was not on the level of some of these other insurrections like the Civil War, right? 
but nevertheless, it fits within the text's understanding of what it should be known as moving forward. Well, I mean, I think I think the Civil War is relevant because that's the backdrop of the amendment. But I think when the framers said insurrection or rebellion uh, when of the 14th Amendment, they would have included uh, the Whiskey Rebellion in that. I think, um, you know, there's a there's a legal definition of insurrection. There's a political definition and a colloquial definition. You know, some people would tell you, I think probably Mark Graber, the scholar, will tell you, well, any two people who, you know, resist any law uh, with with force or the threat of force are committing an insurrection. I mean, you know, by by we, we could make such a sweeping definition that almost every uh, protest that that had any violence on the margins uh, was an insurrection um you know and 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 it's it's kind of interesting because you're uh, reading some of the amicus briefs that are trying to offer like an originalist definition of insurrection and they're going back to the um you know the laws the common law and the british monarchy you know these were not exactly liberal societies they were like monarchies and um and so, so it was basically considered, you know, that a large crowd of ruffians, you know, was itself an insurrection. That's definitely not our modern progressive understanding about how how political protest works. We have a lot of tolerance for, for political protest uh, in America, whether you like it or not. We have a huge history of you know large people gathering in an attempt to to influence policy, and it's quite common um, that there is at least some some violence involved. So. So, you know, I don't think it works to just use the maximalist definition because it just becomes kind of uh, unworkable, um, you know, and then, and then separately, there's the question of whether people engaged, uh, you know, whether whether Donald Trump engaged in it, you know, maybe maybe some of the people whom the Justice Department convicted of seditious conspiracy, it could have also convicted for insurrection in a criminal trial, but you know, the fact pattern is different for each individual. So I don't think uh, January 6th, you know, me, you know, I think it's fine to call it an insurrection. Uh, it's fine to call, um, you know, it's fine to use political hyperbole. That's like the nature of our, our politics. Or, But but I don't think it really meets the criteria. And in, in, certainly in a sense where we can disqualify someone from the ballot for it without without a process. Andy Craig, you believe that Trump engaged in insurrection? Why? Well, on the first point, um, whether or not Donald Trump engaged in it, I mean, this was something he did not just incite. He organized, caused it to happen, uh, provided material assistance. Um, you know, it simply it simply would not have happened for him, but for him. Um, and I think that's relevant. But as for what, what constitutes an insurrection, um, I agree that things like the Whiskey Rebellion, the Shays Rebellion, um, on the kind of more laudable side, even John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, um, as much as we might admire the motive for that, was, is something that would, would fall under the understanding of what counts as an insurrection. And there's a few things... Uh, that do limit it, because I agree this is a concern that we don't want to have uh, every every riot in the country, every civil disturbance. Does that then become an insurrection? But the 14th Amendment speaks specifically of an insurrection against the Constitution, and I think that's relevant here. Um, this was a large body of people, thousands of people, who might not have been well organized, but they were organized. They were assembled and motivated and acted to a coherent shared purpose. They attacked the United States Capitol, the seat of government. They forcibly dispersed Congress in order to prevent it from carrying out a core essential constitutional function of certify, counting and certifying the results of a presidential election. Uh, with the ultimate goal of installing what would have been an unelected, unconstitutional autocrat in place of our elected presidency. Um, and when you talk about the scale of it, I mean, a lot of these things that we point to historically were either less violent, less deadly, or involved a smaller number of people. Um, I do think it's true that there needs to be some minimum you know, hundreds, thousands of people 
Uh, it's not something that, you know, two people can't get together and do an insurrection together. Um, but when you're talking about a fundamental disruption attack on core constitutional institutions carrying out their responsibilities, doing so violently, doing so for the purpose of obstructing the U.S. Constitution, um, I think this is something that in 1868 would have been widely recognized as an insurrection by the plain dictionary definition of it. And that's why it became the common term to describe it so quickly. And when we compare it to the Civil War, I mean, that's why the, the 14th Amendment speaks of insurrection or rebellion. Uh, the Confederacy was, was on a much larger scale. It was rebellion. It was actually setting up an alternate government, claiming territory and all the rest of it. Um, but all the examples we have of something that, that is just insurrection, uh, many of them are on a scale similar to what happened on January 6th. One limiting principle, I think, and you, you kind of find this in some of the early, in some of the language of various versions of the Insurrection Act and so on, is that, you know, uh, something changes from a riot to an insurrection, uh, you know, or, or one relevant metric uh, for that continuum is when the state can no longer enforce the laws through ordinary means. And um, there were, I, I suppose, a couple hours um, where the state was was unable um, to do that on, on January 6th. But again, if you look at the Whiskey Rebellion, for example, the, the marshals, the United States marshals could not go to Western Pennsylvania because they would basically be tarred and feathered. I mean, the, U the, the United States government, uh, the, the violence was so sustained or the threat of violence was so real that the state's police power basically no longer existed. Um, and of course, you know, in, in every riot that, 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 that happens momentarily. But in, in this case, basically, uh, you know, the rioters were dispersed after a few hours and were able to be prosecuted quite swiftly and quite severely under the normal courts. You know, there, there was no need for uh, military courts or some extraordinary process. The, the, the basic authority of the government was, was interrupted. And, you know, obviously, I, I don't feel the need to make a lot of, you know, to be sure this was, you know, an egregious thing. Of course it was. But I think that that's a relevant metric that um, law enforcement was able to proceed. Um, and so anyway, that's that's just one uh, one point of distinction to think about. So, Jason, what would be, in your opinion, the strongest reason for thinking that Trump engaged in insurrection? And obviously you side on seeing it as ultimately wrong, but I, I, I like to ask this question because it's a way for, uh, you know, a, a, a thoughtful proponent of a viewpoint to be able to, through their judgment, um, sort of hierarchically order what's the strongest reason they've come across. I think that helps us see, you know, both sides of the issue and, and, and what reasons sort of um, are most powerful here. So if you had to tell me what the strongest reason for thinking, even though in the end you disagree with it, what would you say is the strongest reason for thinking Trump did engage in insurrection? Well, there's two separate questions. The Trump engaging, I, you know, I, I feel like we sort of, um, I mean, I think the most egregious thing that Trump did in the course of this was to not act during the riot. And we'll probably learn more about this at his criminal trial. But, you know, the, the way that he stood by, you know, and seemed to basically be delighted by this, by this riot, um, is, is an egregious thing. Whether that constitutes engaging, I don't know. It's certainly the thing that's most offensive to me about all of his, all of his conduct, all of which was very bad. But I think that that that's the most you know atrocious thing. So if that if that constitutes engaging or um, in some way, that's that's just the part that that sticks out to me as um, especially appalling. And Andy, same question. What's the strongest reason for thinking Trump did not engage in insurrection that you've come across? Well, on the point of Trump engaging in it, I think the strongest argument would probably be uh, that his plan was not terribly coherent. Um, I do not know that he necessarily had in mind uh, something for it to play out the way it did. I mean, nobody could have predicted that the police lines would be overrun like they did. I do think he intended that it would be violent. I, int I think he intended it to have a coercive effect. 
on Congress and the vice president and the rest of it. Um, but, you know, you can question the degree to which this was a plan for it to, um, you know, result in people literally storming the floors of the House and Senate, um, as opposed to, you know, people fighting the police lines outside, which is kind of what might have been more expected. Um, and on the question of whether it was an insurrection, I mean, the, the point Jason mentioned that I, I do find the most borderline even though I'm not ultimately persuaded by it, is the the length of time. Um, I think the scale of it was sufficient. Um, but if you if you're looking at it did last a few hours and then there was the I mean we 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 had downtown DC uh effectively under National Guard, um, you know, military occupation isn't quite the right way to put it, but we did have military forces defending the Capitol for the next two weeks after that. So I think that's relevant and not just the events of the day of January 6th. But if you look at the core of what we're calling the insurrection, um, it's true. It lasted a few hours. And so I think that's the most, uh, that's the, that's the strongest grounds I think on which to dispute it. Um, even though I think the, the, the scale and purpose of it was sufficient. I think an interesting question to ask here, uh, because we're dealing with a constitutional provision, uh, because we're, we're parsing language uh, so closely, is zooming out a bit and asking a question about our constitutional interpretive frameworks. So here's a question I'm going to ask both of you. How has your preferred model of constitutional interpretation fared in this question of Trump's fitness? vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, section three of the 14th Amendment. First, tell me whether you're approaching this from an originalist or whatever other interpretive framework, and then tell me why your stance on Trump's fitness kind of vindicates that model. I mean, I will start by acknowledging that uh, after oral arguments, it seems pretty clear the Supreme Court is going to reach what I think is the wrong decision on this. But this whole argument was kicked off uh, in very large part by the Bode Paulson article, and they're uh, they're both originalists, and they argue, I think, very convincingly from that framework of what did this word mean, and how would it have been understood at the time in 1868 when the Fourteenth Amendment was being ratified. Um, I would go a little bit further to say, as much as I think all that's correct and valuable. The, the kind of original public meaning and original intent is properly understood as being for resolving ambiguity when the plain text doesn't answer it. And so from a more literally textualist perspective, um, I think you can get there with just the plain dictionary definition of these words, including if you want dictionaries from the time, um, without necessarily having to go into to all these things that are uh, the legislative history and what was said on the while they were debating it in Congress and all that, and I think that's informative. Um, but I, I don't think it's strictly necessary to reach that. Um, and so I think I think the plain text of the Fourteenth Amendment holds up pretty well here. That if you just look at it on the common sense facial reading of it, um, I I think I think it applies. He did it, Jason. I mean, no, I think that that's a fascinating question because, like you said, uh, this was um, set off by originalists. Will Bode is probably the most prominent academic originalist, at least young, you know, originalist in the academy. Um, and and Michael Stokes Paulson has been has been been at it for longer, and is you know, sort of an originalist wherever the results may lead. Um, I mean, I think Scalia once described himself as a faint-hearted originalist. I'd say, you know, in conservative jurisprudence, there's originalism where you're going to take, you know, whatever you think the, the Constitution says and apply it uh, no matter what. And, you know, maybe not care as much about the consequences or the outcomes. I'd say also there's a more Burkean sensibility, a more small C conservative sensibility and jurisprudence, which, um, you know, sees a more modest perhaps role for the courts that doesn't doesn't want the courts to uh, work total upheavals on society without a strong um, 
basis and legitimacy that, that you know, prefers um, interpretations that sort of work within the um, accepted and, you know, that cares more about precedent, that cares more about the legitimacy of the court, all of these things. And I, I would put myself, you know, I think the original meaning is really important. And I'm also, uh, you know, sort of a Burkean conservative. So I think that that um, shapes my view and that I do, um, and that, you know, first of all, I don't think, I think the originalist evidence is tough. I mean, you can make a sort of um, purist originalist case that like, look, the definition of insurrection at common law included almost all protests and, you know, or all, you know, large protests and, you know, just sort of incredibly expansive terms. And that's just what it says. So we can disqualify candidates. We can disqualify them after people have voted. Why not? You know, we can do, you know, the, we have judicial supremacy and the courts can just do whatever they want to the political system, you know, as long as they have the right historical evidence. You know, that's not me. I, I think um, I, I'm more Burkean in my approach. And I, and so I think that uh, the idea of uh, disqualifying someone in this, in this way is the fact that it's unworkable is relevant. I mean, it's, and it's not, you know, and that's the spirit of the constitution, the spirit of the constitution, you know, wants us to provide due process and wants us to create a system that has political legitimacy where people will accept legal outcomes, not, not just have them foisted on them. So, so I would say my, my small C conservatism uh, does, does influence my interpretation of this. And I think it's interesting to see this divide in the, among conservatives, you know, between originalists and more small C conservatives on this question. We've had for the past couple of years a version of that very point where it, it, at a crude level, of course, where any time uh, you would see people plausibly understood to be on the left, um, you, you know, engaging in any kind of protest, uh, some people would say online or, in, you know, in, in columns that why is that not considered an insurrection? Right. And I think they're sort of tracking a version of this idea that if you know, January 6th was an insurrection and they look at the aspects that involve like, you know, the, the riots or the people being unruly, you know, why shouldn't this also be called? But I think something Andy said earlier, uh, sort of an interesting point, it's um, it's worth wondering whether taking insurrection on its own is the relevant metric here or if, or if maybe we ought to see an insurrection against the constitution or against uh, an aspect of the government's um, ongoing viability as what is uh, an insurrection as opposed to just sort of something smaller or lesser than that. So I take your point that um, there's a way to maybe see insurrection stripped of its context as being something that isn't um, only looking at cases where, you know, you take over the Capitol building or, you know, it may just be like a local courthouse or something or you set fire to it. It, it maybe it encompasses something like that. But But then again, I think it was supposed to work in tandem with you know, the operations of the government rather than just um, something less, I guess, consequential to the government's operations. But I actually want to ask a question um, related to something you said there, wh which I think is one of the most interesting points that the justices brought up. And I think, you know, if you were to poll a lot of Americans and you ask them this question of, you know, why, why do you have maybe a little bit of cold feet when it comes to seeing Trump's actions as maybe insurrectionary? I think a lot of people would worry about the potential ripple effects of disqualifying him. So the justices raised concerns in the hearing about the potential consequences of disqualifying Trump. And my question is, how relevant should these considerations be when it comes to determining whether someone has fallen afoul of a constitutional provision? You just gave me uh, an answer there, Jason, where um, it, it, it's a part of the jurisprudence to take into account the legitimacy, the ongoing legitimacy of the court. Um, but let me ask it slightly differently. In your own calculus for determining whether Trump should be disqualified based on the Constitution, is this "quote unquote" social impact factor a, a rightly important one? Why? Well, I think yeah. And you know, first of all, if Trump were convicted under the insurrection statute, I wouldn't have a problem. You know, I think he would be disqualified. And I, and if Trump were convicted by the House, impeached him for insurrection. 
and the Senate, 57 senators voted to convict him in the, in the Senate trial. So if in either the impeachment or the criminal process, this was adjudicated as an insurrection, um, which is fine, you know, they have their own definitions. I wouldn't say that they were wrong. Um, then, then sure, uh, disqualify, you know, whatever the, whatever the outcomes. <laughs> My point is that you need to have when, when you're overriding the uh, political process in this kind of way that's never been done before, where people are already voting and people assume that they they can vote for this candidate and then judges, uh, you know, remove him from the ballot, essentially, you know, just blocking the Republican primary from proceeding. That can be done. You know, this idea that it has to be not everything has to be democratic. It's fine to do that. Like I said, if, if the set two thirds of the Senate wanted to do this, they could do this. If a if a federal jury under um, uh, you know the supervision of a federal court applying the law um, convicted Trump and the conviction was sustained, those are those are reasons to override democracy. But those are processes that people understand and that have legitimacy and that have you know have the expectation. Um, you know, people people know the cops know that that can happen. You can't just sort of surprise them. And during the primary, my my point is that um, when you use a process that lacks legitimacy, when you when you do when you short circuit the the proper processes for doing something, um, you are sort of um, I think undermining the constitutional order. So I, I think uh, you know it's all it's all mixed in. The the fact that the consequences would be bad, you know, is not is not by itself. A reason not to do something, but the fact that the consequences could be bad because people would rightly see the the Constitution being flouted um, is is something to consider. I think you know it's all a question of political legitimacy, and I think go, you know we haven't mentioned Griffin's case, which I you know which is the Salmon P. Chase eighteen sixty nine opinion on the Fourteenth Amendment, Section three. But he basically says, uh, look, ascertaining whether someone uh, committed insurrection requires evidence and proceedings. It requires a process. You know, we 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 have these processes in order to ascertain the truth. And and so Sam and P. Chase is saying we need a process uh, for this. So is that is that an outcome based argument or is that just a, 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 an acknowledgement of reality? I mean, Sonia Sotomayor at oral argument said Sam Sam and P. Chase was just looking at you know his policy preferences and and not looking. Well, I mean, I. I guess the 14th Amendment itself contains a due process requirement. It says nobody uh, shall be denied due process. So I think, um, you know, just just pragmatically acknowledging this is a really hard inquiry. It's really important that people accept the results of this inquiry and can, that enough people can see it as legitimate. Um, you know, that that's um, that, that I think Sabbath P. Chase was right about that. So I think it's all it's all sort of tied together. And I think uh, prudence counsels that that you are aware of of what kind of processes people will accept as legitimate. So I'm going to ask about process here in in my next question. But before I, I want to get Andy, I want to get your thoughts on the same question. So I actually think I was underselling uh, the the kind of weight of this question on the justices' minds. It's not just the conservative members of the court. So you had someone like Elena Kagan bring up a worry about. You know, one state, you know, deciding for the rest of the country and how that could be the implicit argument with that that's potentially seen as illegitimate for the rest of the country having to sort of abide by that. What do you think about this potential ripple effects kind of consideration? Well, uh, I think it's absolutely right uh, to have a, an aversion in general to doing something like this. This is an extreme remedy. Um, but I would say that we're this is extreme circumstances. I don't think we've had anything like this where a sitting president uh, incited a violent attack on the constitution to keep himself in office and so i do think it would be proper if the court did reach the merits of this which they're probably not going to um, to articulate that standard i mean inter interpreting section three itself is a federal question that should be resolved by the supreme court uh, either way, even if I think they get it wrong, that's in their ballpark. Um, but on this this process point, I mean, I would just say that this is arising in the particular context of ballot access. Uh, 
Um, and ballot access is something that's run by the states. It is handled through civil litigation. Um, we've heard mentioned a few times the federal insurrection statute, and there's both historical and textual reasons that doesn't map very well onto the 14th Amendment. Um, in fact, that, that statute, 18 uh, U.S.C. 2383, that defines a crime of insurrection and has a disqualification from only federal, not state, offices, uh, it actually predates the 14th Amendment. And Section 3 was in part written to uh, remedy what was seen as the insufficiencies of the only doing this on the basis of criminal prosecution. Um, but it, candidates get kicked off the ballot all the time in the United States under ballot access laws um, for arcane technical reasons. Their petitions were insufficient. They didn't meet some qualification. Um, and so in that regard, particularly the way this shot up straight to the Supreme Court, um, I think that's that's in line with how ele election law matters are handled in general all the time for everybody. And that uh, the state by state point, I mean, that's just how presidential elections work. Every four years, there are candidates that are on the ballot in some states and not others. And we care about it less because they're usually minor party candidates. They're irrelevant. They're not going to get one or two percent of the vote anyway. Um, but I don't think it's right that the legal standard should be different for Trump just because he's a leading candidate who has a lot of support. Um, I think we should apply the same the rules in the same way with the same kind of standards, which is usually highly deferential to the states on this under the, um, it's called Anderson verdict, the balancing test the Supreme Court has applied. And the courts have been generally unfavorable to candidates saying I was wrongly kicked off the ballot. So I think one frustration that people have with this question of process more broadly is it's unclear to them why this whole process is so difficult, not just in terms of settling whether Trump uh, committed insurrection or should be on the ballot, but even settling who is the relevant government authority or body to look at this decisively and at what point, and then how a different body might interact with that. So we have individual states, we have the Supreme Court, we've got Congress. Um, wh why, why is this such a difficult matter, Andy, figuring out, um, what the process, the, the order of operations here should be? Well, I think that's partly because, um, one is section three doesn't address this point, um, which is, you know, if I was going to go back and rewrite it, that was certainly be something I would add clarity to. Can I ask you a question on this? Because it seems like the, the section three of the 14th amendment does include something where it says, if you want to change to this, then Congress can step in. But other than that, it's sort of operable already or it's operative already, right? Or that's, that's right. There's the process for congressional amnesty, but that admittedly does not answer the question of how do you make the determination in the first place if somebody's disqualified, if Congress needs to grant them an amnesty. Um, I would say the answer to that is that it depends on what context it's arising in. Um, you can have our, our election process is very complicated, particularly when we're talking about for president. Um, you have the, the states playing a role in how they set up and administer their elections. Then you have the electoral college. Then you have it goes uh, in particular, um, possibly the courts and litigation both before and after the election. And then ultimately it does go to Congress uh, during the electoral count on January 6th. And I think it matters that this is this case is arising in the particular context of pre-election decisions about ballot access and that's something that goes through these state procedures and then you can appeal it to court including appealing it up the chain to federal court and so that's proper but that doesn't preclude that for example congress on january 6th and there is the procedure for this in the deliberately left in place when we reformed the electoral count act uh, a couple years ago that Congress could say, no, we're not going to accept votes for this person because they're not eligible. I mean, Congress did that once with a, a Horace Greeley who had died in 1872. Like that's fairly well established. But that is 
on the back end of what is going to be the certified result of the electoral college vote. Um, I don't think that means, and that could be, you know, they're not a natural born citizen. They're not 35 years old, whatever the case may be. Um, but that doesn't mean that states have to put ineligible candidates on the ballot on the front end. I mean, it's generally uncontroversial and undisputed and states do it frequently. We're seeing now with uh, Sink Uyghur and we've seen it with other candidates where the state says, no, you're not eligible. We're not going to put you on the ballot. Um, and then you can appeal that through the process, through the courts we have. Um, but that that is the appropriate way to decide ballot access issues. Um, and if we were to, I mean, the, the one case we have in the history where Section 3 was terribly abused uh, was in 1919 with Victor Berger uh, out of Milwaukee. And to make a long story short, he had been convicted um, of, of basically opposing World War I when Woodrow Wilson was, was criminalizing dissent under the Espionage and Sedition Acts. And Congress said they pointed to that conviction and said that's disqualifying. And ultimately, uh, he, that, elect, that conviction was overturned. He was eventually seated. Um, but I think that points to the danger. I mean, the criminal process is dependent on the president and his administration deciding to pursue uh, prosecution. It, it's, it's in some ways more susceptible to abuse, I think. Um, and so I think that's one of the problems with trying to take this out of the civil law realm where it belongs. Jason, what has been the most frustrating argument you've heard the other side make? And why does it frustrate you more than other arguments? Like, I'll give you an example for me. Um, the idea that the presidency would not be encompassed by, you know, the list of offices and, and Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is frustrating for me. Just, you know, using a simple a ah, fortiori ar argument, you know, where you reason from the lesser to the greater, are we really supposed to believe that, you know, the concerns they had over traitors and insurrectionists gaining legislative office was of great concern, but you know, someone gaining the presidential office wasn't, right? So um, that would be for me. What would be a frustrating argument you've heard and why do you see it that way? Well, first, just a word on the your, the point you made about the presidency and the officers. I had sort of not paid much attention to that because it just sort of seemed kind of technical and like a sideshow. It does seem like uh, Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson is interested in that as a way out of this case. And I will say that it sort of, overlaps with my process concern because the presidency is the only official elected uh, nationally. So disqualifying him by one state poses problems that no, that, that, that are posed by no other elected official. Um, so it is actually, uh, you know, prag it, it seems on its surface uh, super technical, but there's actually kind of a practical elegance to it, perhaps. You know, I happen to agree with you. I don't think, you know, I think the president is an officer. You know, you have to distinguish between officer of and officer under. And you know, it's it's not. You know, it's it doesn't doesn't convince me. But but there is um, the fact that the that um, section three being self executing is especially unworkable against the president as opposed to um, any other kind of official who who is really uh, just subject to one state's processes. But the most the most frustrating to me. Uh, continuing on this point is probably the argument, oh, well, states, you know, they decide whether someone's 35 all the time and, you know, they decide whether there are enough signatures. I mean, that's true enough. And I, and I take the point as a, you know, way to think about how, how we adjudicate qualifications, but this is just so different from that because this is a totally uh, politicized question and it's it's fundamentally a question that requires a different kind of process uh, from those questions. So I, I think trying to shoehorn insurrection or aid and aid or comfort to enemies into um, these other kinds of uh, quotidian ballot access disputes is just I mean, it, it might it might be a legal argument that works by analogy or so on. But it just in, in practice, that's the thing that to me seems most um, unrealistic. Andy, what's the most frustrating argument you've heard the other side make, and why do you find it so frustrating? I would say it's exactly that point you mentioned about these arguments that the president isn't an officer. Um, and 
I think it's frustrating because I don't think it's historically true. Um, it involves cherry picking uh, a very few uh, arguments that cut against the a lot of examples we have of people explicitly discussing the presidency is covered by this um, and the plain language of the Constitution itself that calls the presidency an office two dozen times. Um, so that's I would say that's the most probably um, frustrating argument, and I hope that's not the one the court goes for. Uh, among the others, they could pick um, to dispose of this this case in Trump's favor, um, and and so yeah, I would I would say that one. That's that's the one that has gained oddly a lot of traction. Um, it was really the focus of Trump's brief, and even though um, Justice uh, Jackson did uh, seem to indicate some sympathy for it, there wasn't a lot of attention for it from the other justices. Um, so I suspect they're going to decide it on other grounds about the powers of the states, the role of the states in a presidential election and all those sorts of things, rather than, um, this really flies in the face of common sense sort of thing that the president is, is somehow not an officer or doesn't hold an office. Jason, why should Trump not be disqualified based on section three of the 14th amendment? I suppose it would be democracy. Um, people expect that they're going to get to pick their own president in an election. Uh, let's have them continue to do that. Andy, the other side, why should Trump be disqualified based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? I would say kind of at the, at the deep, most intuitive level, it's that this is about somebody who did not accept the electoral process, that these, uh, this is breaking the rules of the game in a way that gets you kicked out, and that the whole reason we have elections is to try to avoid the kind of violent social conflict that he inflicted on us and is very likely in various ways to try to do again. Jason, Andy, thank you very much. Appreciate you guys coming on and debating this. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Zooming In, a project of the unpopulist. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts and also check out Reimagining Liberty, our sister podcast at The Unpopulist, where host Aaron Ross Powell explores the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. For more like this, make sure to subscribe for free at theunpopulist.net. Until next time.